So for those of you who don't know us up here, I'm Nicole Ozer. I'm the Technology and Civil Liberties Policy Director at the ACLU of Northern California. So it's my job to work on privacy and free speech and new technology for the ACLU. And joined by my good friend and often co-conspirator for good, Kevin Banks in at EFF. So um, we're really glad to be here with you guys. And um, you know, not only are we going to show a couple funny clips, but we're also going to show some deeper clips. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin uh, to show our next one. Hi, guys. Uh, thank you so much for showing up at this uh, late hour. Uh, I hope that you will be entertained and enlightened and that you'll uh, participate. We'd love to hear what you guys have to say. Um, but you want to go ahead and play the next clip? Uh, by the way, uh, Senior Staff Attorney of the Electronic Frontier Foundation work most of the <laughs> I have a hit on Echelon, Blackbriar, I repeat, Blackbriar. Looks like it's coming from a European signal. NSA, please confirm your receipt. Sir. We intercepted a call in London. Keyword Black Pride. Okay, send it to New York right away. So what you're watching here is uh, the Bourne Supremacy, the third in the Bourne series of films. And uh, I'll go ahead and start talking because you actually saw the most important part of that clip, which was... Um intercepted a call in London. Keyword Black Pride. Okay, send it to New York right away. Track the phone. Registered to a London reporter named Simon Ross. Works at the Guardian newspaper. You're tracking him? Sir, yeah. Thanks, Mike. We uh, have a survey team covering him at work and a sneak and peek on their way to his apartment. Well, who talked to him? How did you find out about the Black Friday? I don't know. We pulled his background and run a cross-check on any known anomalies. We've come up with nothing, but I think if we follow Ross, we're going to be able right. to... Right. Ross is easy. You want the source. Um... So this is from the Born Supremacy, and the, the obvious reason why we're showing this is because of its reference to Echelon. How many people have heard of Echelon before? Oh, I love DEF CON. Um, <laughs> Echelon was a cooperative effort, is a cooperative effort between US intelligence and UK intelligence and Japanese intelligence that since, uh, well, for many decades now, has been sucking up pretty much the entire radio spectrum all the communications going over radio across the globe in a concerted intelligence effort that involves, amongst other things, as you saw in this clip, uh, voice recognition of particular key phrases uh, that might be indicative of something intelligence analysts would like to know about. And so here, Blackbriar is the name of the secret program that trains assassins like uh, Jason Bourne. And so I guess I've already answered the first question is, is this possible? But what's of particular note is that since 2005, we found out that Echelon had essentially moved inside the United States and from the radio spectrum uh, onto the fiber optic networks inside of our country. 
Uh, this is what we often refer to as the NSA warrantless wiretapping program. And although President Bush at the time, when the New York Times first exposed the program, characterized it as being narrowly targeted at the communications of terrorists communicating internationally between the U.S. and other countries, um, various sources of information, including a heroic whistleblower named Mark Klein, who literally showed up on EFF's doorstep, former AT&T technician, uh, showing how this system was hooked up. Uh, basically, it was revealed that the program is, is much, much larger, and regardless of who the analysts are actually targeting to listen to or targeting whose emails to read, the program actually sucks up uh, masses of, um, of communications uh, data, including yours and mine. And so, is it possible? Yes. Uh, is it legal? Hell no, we don't think so, and that's why we and the ACLU have sued uh, uh, both the government and telecommunications companies over that program. Um, thank you. Go ahead and play clip two. We can flip back to the video screen. Have you heard of an Operation Blackbriar? You have details. I'm going to get my head around this and type it up. I'll see you first thing. Is that all? Yeah. I want rendition protocols and to put the asset on standby just in case. People, listen up. This is a full priority situation. Jimmy, give me Ross's profile on one. Yes, sir. Our target is a British national, Simon Ross, a reporter. I want all his phones, his Blackberry, his apartment, his car, bank accounts, credit cards, travel patterns. I want to know what he's going to think before he does. Every dirty little secret he has. And most of all, we want the name and real-time location of his source. This is NSA priority level four. Any questions? All right, let's get to it. So there wasn't a particular surveillance technique, uh, technical surveillance technique mentioned there, but I just got to say, as a civil libertarian and a film buff, this sequence, which happened near the beginning of the film, was like crack to me, because it was <laughs> echelon NSA spying, sneak and peek warrants, which are uh, no-notice searches of your home, although this is actually happening extraterritorially, so the Fourth Amendment wouldn't apply, so... I guess they could do that. Um, and rendition, uh, otherwise uh, known as kidnapping and torture. Um, so, great movie. You should check it out if you haven't seen it. Um, what's our next clip? Oh, our next clip. These are the kinds of things, by the way, that Kevin and I talk about. When we see movies, we don't talk about, you know, the other part of the plot. We're like, you know, there are some great parts in there that, de that depict our work. So we definitely are some geeks in this area. So our next clip that we're going to show is actually turning direction quite a lot. Um, going back in time to Minority Report. How many of you actually saw this Steven Spielberg, Tom Cruise? So I'd have to say, not my favorite Lick, you know, it had some weird kind of things in there. Um, but it's got a really interesting clip that um, really talks about physical surveillance. So let's take a look at it, and I really want us to talk about in the audience sort of if any of this is possible, if there are folks in the audience that have been working on this, um, what's legal and what's ethical. Oh, before we start that, I did want to make a comment about the Simpsons clip. Uh, first off, the technology of that robot driver. I'm not really sure uh, how that works. But, I mean, the basic technology of having microphones posted in public places, including public buses and trains, is certainly possible and done now. And the rationale for that, the argument for why that is legal, uh, is that uh, you don't have an expectation of privacy in public, something that, unfortunately, there are a number of Supreme Court decisions uh, holding that. So that does raise the frightening prospect of microphones being secreted throughout uh, the public sphere, uh, I'm sure you've seen notices on a variety of public transit uh, to this effect. Uh, I don't think they run a direct line to the NSA. Uh, they probably just go to some, you know, audio tape somewhere that no one ever listens to. But regardless, yes, sir. Oh, we're going to get to that, sir. Oh, yeah. Don't uh, you worry. And, and you, sir.
I'm not, I'm not familiar with this. If you could come talk to me after the panel, I'd like to hear more about that. But I, uh, hmm. where where was that? What state? Maryland. Okay. Well, I expect the argument against that would be the argument for what you saw in The Simpsons, which is he was recording that police officer in public. Um, that. So that would be the state law then, because federal law is one party consent. But many machinations. Well, we can perhaps talk about that case more uh, after after the rest of the clips. But let's yeah. uh, move on. What you gonna do when they come for you? Nobody now gives you no break. thinking you must really like me, don't you, Fletcher? That's why you asked to partner with me on this little sortie, isn't it? I think you're swell company, huh? It's not that you don't trust me to be alone with the chief, is it? That you think I might, you know, futz with him if I had the chance? No, I just want to watch him use your body to sandblast another building, that's all, Jeff. Havana, go. I show 27 warm bodies. Roger that. Confirm 27 warm bodies. What do you think, four spiders, one per floor? Let's do eight. I gotta eat. Residents of 931 Powell, residents of 931 Powell, this is Officer Fletcher of DC Pre Crime. Under authority of PC Section 6409, we are deploying spiders into your complex.
away from me. What do you guys think? A drunk baby can't wake up? Yeah, some guy who doesn't want to get rid. Folks, please, be quiet. Close your doors. Get back inside. Be quiet and close the door. Let's see. All right, so a seriously creepy and pretty melodramatic clip, but it brings up some important issues and particularly important technology. So we had in that clip a couple of things. We had thermal imaging, we had sort of smart security robotics, and we had biometrics. Um, and I'm sure that most of the folks, many of the folks in this audience know more about what's really possible than I do, and I was hoping to learn a bit more in that sensor talk, but I couldn't even get in. It was so crazy today. Um, but is there anyone working in this area that sort of sees a lot of this almost on the horizon? Is there anyone in there? All right. Well, and on the legal side, one of the things that we really want to talk about is for those who were here earlier for the EFF talk about laptop searches got a little bit of a primer on the Fourth Amendment. But when we're talking about searches, when we're talking about thermal imaging, it's talking about the Fourth Amendment. So the Fourth Amendment protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. Oh. Any calls? They turned off their <laughs> cell okay. phones. If you have a reasonable expectation of privacy, the government needs a warrant to search or seize. So we had in there, we had bots going into an apartment building, scanning everyone's eyes. So the question is, is this actually legal? Does it violate the Fourth Amendment? Um, and to answer that, we actually have to turn to some dog cases. So true, we've got a bunch of dog sniffing cases um, out there. And a lot of them have a lot to do with the issue about whether or not this is legal. So in 2005, there was a Supreme Court case called Illinois versus Cabalas, which is a routine traffic stop. Um, there was another cop in the area who happened to have a dog sniffing, a drug sniffing dog with him. So he stopped by, the dog sniffs this guy's car, alerts that there's some drugs, and the cops get into the trunk. The court says that it's actually um, that this warrantless dog sniff was not unconstitutional because they said it was not intrusive. The dog wasn't all up in there with this guy's stuff in the trunk. You know, he was just going around the side. And that it was actually limited capture, that the dog sniffing this guy's trunk only captured information related to the fact that he'd been involved in wrongdoing. And the court has said that um, the expectation that certain facts won't come to the attention of authorities is not the same as an interest in privacy that society is prepared to consider reasonable. So the bottom line is your hash stash is not a privacy interest, according to the court. And so it means that, you know, if, if there's this dog sniffing along the outside, that the Fourth Amendment doesn't stop this from happening. So the police get to pass go, collect $200, they don't need a warrant. Um, this clip is obviously a lot more intrusive than a dog sniffing around the trunk of a car. We've got the bots coming into the apartment. We've got them stopping the people, making them stop, opening their eyes. Um, it's also capturing a lot more information about their identity. It's not just capturing information about whether or not there's drugs in that apartment building. It's actually capturing who they are. And really important to the fact about whether or not this kind of thing is legal is the location of where this is happening. It's not happening on a public street. It's actually happening in someone's apartment building where they live. And very much in sort of um, legal jurisprudence, the home is really our castle. And this, this clip also brought up issues related to thermal scanning. And that's actually also been um, looked at by the Supreme Court in a case called Kylo, um, where it was found that warrantless thermal imaging of somebody's house was unconstitutional. 
um, because it also captured much more than the fact that somebody had pot in their house and was growing pot. It actually, as they said, it captured whether or not the lady of the house was engaged in bathing. So details of the home that otherwise the police wouldn't have been able to get to. So here the police obviously couldn't have figured out that Hottie Tom Cruise was in the, you know, the bathtub unless they had thrown the bots in. So we've got the dog sniff cases which say no Fourth Amendment protection. We've got the thermal imaging cases that say um, there is Fourth Amendment protection. Now what about a dog sniff or a thermal imaging of the house? And we have a case like that from 2006 which said you can't lead a dog up to somebody's house have them sniff for pot and have it still be on, still have it be constitutional without a warrant. So we have sort of a, a mishmash of cases in this area, but it just goes to show you that these kinds of clips, you know, it's not quite as cut and dry. And here for the DEF CON crowd, you know, this seems like a physical surveillance clip, but this kind of um, jurisprudence about dog sniffing actually really translates a lot to things that we're doing in electronic communications because we've got dog sniffing and we've got packet sniffing. And there's a lot of thought out there that just like a dog is not being intrusive, they're just going around the side, they're only finding information that you've done wrong, there's a lot of talk out there that if a computer, not a sentient being, um, very much similar people analogize to a dog, is actually sifting through all of the data that's traveling through in packets that a Fourth Amendment also shouldn't be implicated. So this is a real issue that Kevin and I are having to work on, talking about the fact that there needs to be an understanding that a search occurs at the time when information is collected and sifted and not just later on. So um, this also has a real impact um, on when we're using Gmail. Um, if we're actually allowing companies to sift through our information for marketing purposes, we have a lot of worries that that's going to implicate people's reasonable expectation of privacy is when the court looks at these issues. So it looks like kind of a crazy clip, but unfortunately it's not quite as crazy as it may seem when you get down into the weeds of a lot of the court cases that we deal with every day. So yeah, so just remember the legal rule is if the robots are all up in your business, that's unconstitutional. Um, <laughs> I mean, really, what, what's portrayed in that clip is so, is so unconstitutional. Even Antonin Scalia would think it was a dead easy case. Um, on the issue of dog sniffing and the precedent that sets for surveillance methods that only detect contraband, we've seen this discussed in particular in the context of child porn. Um, I can think of in particular an article written by Richard Salgado, a former DOJ attorney, then at Yahoo, now at Google, uh, who, amongst other things, plays the judge at Hacker Court at Black Hat, uh, which we did a couple of days ago. He wrote an article arguing that it would, be, uh, it would not be a search for providers to be provided with hashes of child porn to then match against their traffic uh, to determine whether their traffic contained child porn, because the argument being child porn is unprotected speech, it's clearly illegal, and so if, if this stuff has been adjudicated to be child porn, then scanning everybody's content to see if it contains that would not be a search. Um, but anyway, let's go ahead and take a look at the next clip, uh, or two clips, well, let's do one at a time, from The Departed, and this is surveillance of a, uh, an arms deal that's going on where the FBI or the law enforcement folks have an informant uh, Leo DiCaprio pretending to be one of the bad guys while the bad guys have Matt Damon pretending to be one of the good guys. It's a good movie. Oh, I think he cut it when it accidentally started. Could we get the sound back on the computer? Piece of cake. He'll operate the cameras, you ID the guys and log them. All cell phone signals are under surveillance through the courtesy of our federal friends over there. Patriot Act. Patriot Act. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, can they do it? Y'all can do it. I mean, really, it just takes antennas uh, and some cracking ability. Uh, but uh, it's actually not legal for them to do that. Uh, the Patriot Act does not... Uh, actually, uh, modified wiretapping law in, an, in relatively minor ways, particularly in the law enforcement context... It added to the types of crimes that one could wiretap for, 
but it certainly would not give them authority to wiretap every cell phone in the area, uh, although I do think it was is probably within their technical capabilities. But let's go ahead and play the next clip. They turned off their cell phones. Search randomly for calls made from the area. 807 phones are live in this area. They narrow the area. What you see there for service is what you're going to get. Yeah, why the fuck did they turn their phones off? Wait, there's still one phone up. Where? The buyers are there. You know, direct contact with your guys would have its advantages. Uh, so we played that clip because of the obvious tie-in to location surveillance using your cell phone, which is definitely possible and done routinely. Uh, although, again, I certainly hope that tracking the location of every phone in an area uh, is not routine. Although we have seen instances of them getting stored data about everyone who was in a particular area at a particular time. It's called a cell dump. Uh, we saw it in... Uh, an investigation of uh, a bank robbing gang called the Scarecrow Bandits, where they got cell dumps on the cell towers near all the banks that were robbed at the time they were robbed, and then mined that data to try and find out who was at all the locations making calls at the same time. Um, the legal standard for tracking a cell phone is something that uh, we at EFF have been working on for many years. ACLU is also working on that, and we regularly file briefs fighting with the government over whether a warrant is required uh, to track your cell phone or not. Um, there have been a, about three dozen cases now, uh, most of them holding that a warrant is required, hooray, uh, but those are all lower courts. And when the government has lost, it has refused to appeal, even often when the courts encourage them to do so, because if there's a bad rule, if there's a ruling against them in a higher court, say in a circuit court, that's actually going to affect their practice. Um, these dozens of courts ruling against them hasn't affected their practice. They still seek permission to track cell phones without probable cause routinely, and it is routinely that permission is routinely granted. Uh, and so we're doing our best to fight that. Uh, both in court and uh, on Capitol Hill as part of the Digital Due Process Coalition, something I've mentioned uh, in previous panels, if you saw me on those, uh, where we in ACLU and the Center for Democracy and Technology have gotten together with companies such as Google and Microsoft and, and uh, our off-time enemies, AT&T, uh, to get Congress to update uh, electronic privacy law to do a variety of things and, in particular, require warrants for cell phone tracking. Um, and it's, it's not transparent at all. I mean, a lot of times when these orders are, are given, when these cases come through, we don't actually hear about them. So it's only the ones that we hear about that we're able to litigate. And that's why it's so important. Yes, we can go to court, but it would be far better for there to be clear rules about location information. And so Kevin mentioned earlier in one of his talks about the importance of clarifying the rules for email. Um, location information is one of the key pieces there that we also want to make sure that there's warrant protection for all types of location information. And also importantly, we want to, uh, the ACLU is pushing to have reporting requirements so that it's clear to the public and to Congress how often the government is actually demanding this kind of information. In, we have a wiretap report, but we don't have the equivalent um, kinds of reporting for a lot of other types of government demands. And, um, you know, we have to get it through FOIAs or Chris Segoyan getting people drunk to find out this kind of information. Uh, wouldn't it be better to actually have uh, reporting requirements? So we're definitely pushing for that. And also to make sure that if the government actually does violate the law, um, you know, Kevin's been saying that, you know, their practices haven't changed even though courts have, have said that it should be otherwise. And there is no suppression remedy. If the government doesn't follow the law, they can still often use this information in court. So we want to make sure that if the government does break the law, that they also can't continue to use this information. So this is something that uh, Kevin and I work on quite a lot, um, both in the courts but also in the legislature, to try and create better clarity and safeguards for all of our information. Uh, I figure we can take a question or two before we move to our last clip. Uh, 
Uh, they don't have to, but so the question was, uh, can the government get records of your location from the phone company, and exactly what kind of records do the phone companies have? The answers are yes, and we are not sure. Um, I'll start with the second part of the question first. They, phone companies certainly log the cell tower that your call is routed through at the beginning and end of every call. The question is, what else do they store? The answer is, we don't know exactly, and the companies don't, aren't very forthcoming about what else they have. Uh, depending on whether you use uh, location-based services, they may have quite detailed GPS-based or uh, cell tower triangulation data about your past location. Um, this is actually an issue uh, that we are currently litigating. I argued in front of the Third Circuit in February about what the appropriate standard should be if the government wants to obtain uh, historical cell site data uh, or, or other location data about your cell phone. And we're still waiting on a decision there. Our argument, of course, is that a warrant should be required. Uh, that Rather, that the Fourth Amendment requires a warrant and the statute that governs this area allows courts to require a warrant. Um, but so there's, there's a big transparency problem here in terms of knowing exactly what the companies have. They certainly don't have an obligation uh, to store that data for the assistance of law enforcement. Um, however, we have seen evidence of company retention of data because they were paid by the government, uh, provided the funds to build the data centers to store the data just to help the government out voluntarily. Um, and so I would not be surprised if the major carriers uh, have location data stretching back the past 10 years or so. Um, but we honestly don't know. Uh, the best resource I've seen lately on this is from a security researcher named Matt Blaze, who testified to Congress, the House Judiciary uh, Committee's Constitution Subcommittee, about this. And his basic, basic conclusion was they are storing everything they can and that data is getting more accurate by the day, such that triangulation data derived from cell towers is getting more and more accurate to the extent that it will soon, if it does not already, match the accuracy of GPS. So we are looking at huge storehouses of location data uh, tied to your cell phone, available from the providers under currently uncertain legal standards. And who, as Kevin touched on, who has this information is becoming increasingly diffuse as there are location-based services that are other types of third parties. So if you are using location-based services, mapping service, friend-finding services, um, location-based services that you know are to find the restaurants here in Vegas, um, you know those are all different entities that may be collecting vast amounts of information, storing it for indeterminate times, um, disclosing it for indeterminate reasons. So if anyone's actually read some of those privacy policies, um, they're pretty scary, and we've been delving into that quite a bit. Um, as Kevin mentioned, there was a hearing in Congress very recently on this issue, and um, since it is a focus of what we're doing legislatively, we've really been trying to uh, investigate some of these issues further. So if any of you work in that area and would like to help us to understand more, I'm sure Kevin and I would love to chat with you. We have, we have one more question back there, and then we'll go to the... I don't have a good answer for that. I mean, I've not been directly involved in, say, criminal cases where this data has been introduced against a criminal defendant. Certainly, uh, often criminal defendants will try to argue that the data is imprecise, which is funny because the government also likes to argue that the data is imprecise because that strengthens their argument that the Fourth Amendment doesn't protect it. Um, but, uh, I mean, chain of custody, you have someone from the phone company come in and testify, this is the data that we have that was collected when these calls were made. There you go. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure. I mean, if someone introduced some evidence to indict that person to say, you know, to show that it was fabricated, I guess that would be an issue. But I, I've never seen an instance of They've that. They've got so much data, they don't have to fabricate anything. So, Was there one more, and then we'll take the last clip? I 
I think it would depend on the circumstances, right? I mean, reasonableness is a very iffy standard, so it would depend on the situation, it would depend on the reasons, it would depend on, you know, what that identification actually was, the, you know, the limits to that, but I think that we'd have to look at it on a, you know, a fact-by-fact -fact basis. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, I mean, there certainly is an exception to the Fourth Amendment's warrant requirement for exigent circumstances, where there are legitimate emergencies where either evidence is about to be destroyed, and if you go get a warrant, it'll be too late, uh, or where someone's life is at risk. So, but it, it would be a very, as most things, uh, rather fact-specific, case-by-case kind of thing. We lawyers love to say that. Yes, exactly. Should we do the next one? Yeah, clip? one more clip. Beautiful. Beautiful. Unethical. Dangerous. You've turned every cell phone in Gotham into a microphone. And a high frequency generator receiver. You took my sonar concept and applied it to every phone in the city. With half the city feeding you sonar, you can image all of Gotham. This is wrong. I've got to find this man, Lucius. At what cost? The database is now key encrypted. It can only be accessed by one person. This is too much power for one person. That's why I gave it to you. Only you can use it. Spying on 30 million people isn't part of my job description. This is an audio sample. If he talks within range of any phone in the city, you can triangulate his position. I'll help you this one time. But consider this my resignation. As long as this machine is at Wayne Enterprises, I won't be. Morgan Freeman. You see... If only Morgan Freeman existed in real life. That's right. <laughs> we, we could use any surveillance technology we wanted with the assurance that it wouldn't be abused. Um, but it, unfortunately, Morgan Freeman doesn't exist. Um, you know what I mean. Uh, Lucius Fox doesn't exist, whatever. The Morgan Freeman image on film, you know, he played God amongst others. Um, but anyway... Uh, this is a really interesting clip for a lot of reasons. First off, because it raises this ethical issue of how much power is too much power and how do we create checks and balances to ensure that these powers are not abused. And, uh, you know, the closest we do have to Morgan Freeman is judges. Um, and he really ought to play a judge. Has he ever played, has anyone ever seen, Mor has Morgan Freeman played a judge in anything? Oh, well, anyway. Um, but, and so, you know, it's very important to us, the civil libertarians, that judges be in the loop uh, whenever invasive technologies like this are used. Uh, this is also interesting because it's a nice mix of real technology and, I think, crazy, stupid technology. Um, the technology of remotely turning on your microphone to, on your cell phone to use it as a bug, this gentleman brought that up earlier. This is actually a, I don't want to say routine law enforcement technique, but we have certainly seen it in particular in organized crime investigations where they will as they should, get a wiretap order uh, and with the phone company's assistance, uh, turn on the mic of your cell phone. I think this can also be done with landlines. And um, uh, in-car assistance systems. Yes, we've also seen this in, in OnStar type uh, uh, emergency uh, car assistance systems. Um, so yeah, so if you have a mic connected to a network, someone can own it. And that's just the reality of it. Same with video cameras. Um, as we most recently saw in the Lower Marion School District in Pennsylvania, where school officials had installed security software on school-issued laptops and were activating the cameras on those laptops when the students had brought the laptops home. Um, <coughs> I'm curious. Well, and first off, uh, crazy stupid technology. There's no way Batman could have taken over all of these phones without totally killing the bandwidth for all of these providers. <laughs> These providers would know this was happening and, and figure it out and stop it. Uh, I really don't think it would have been possible. But the turning on the mic thing is basically possible. The voice recognition thing is basically possible. What I don't know, is this crazy sonar thing possible at all? Mm-hmm. 
So a hint, a hint of plausibility here. So DEF CON challenge for next year. Build it. <laughs> Build it and we will come. <laughs> um, so yeah, so... <laughs> Indeed. Uh, well, or we'll defend the people who That's build right, it. Exactly. You'll, we'll flip a coin to figure it out. Um, but uh, anyway, so I, I think that's our last clip. We have seven more minutes, so uh, we'll take a few questions, but we also want to get your suggestions on what movies or scenes we might want to include next time we do this you know, sort we're, of we're presentation. We're not professional you know, movie critics. We do this on our, our side time, so we definitely want your thoughts. And, and I think that this last clip also brings up really important things that you know, it may be technologically possible or impossible. It may be legal or illegal, but what's really important is for us as a society to decide if that's the world we want to live in and to push back against Against these things because we may have to litigate something for five, six, seven, eight years, but if there may be more, um, what are we up to? Six on NSA spying? Let's, let's not um, dwell. But you know, there are really a lot of opportunities for the public to push and make sure that these things don't actually get to the light of day, um, and those are things that we really try and, and Hopefully, we'll get your help on. So we have a bunch of questions. So oh, let's one more on. thing, though. I have one bit of great <laughs> trivia. I, I want a couple of people to guess. If a class action attorney found out what Bruce Wayne did there, how much money do you think he'd be liable for mm. under the Wiretap Act? I'll take, I'll take three guesses. I'm to the, uh, the guy that tried to I, I, well, yes, but I, I would like, I, I'm looking for guesses here. How much would this have cost Bruce Wade if he and got sued? And the person for? closest gets the last constitution and a bunch of gummy bears. Okay. <laughs> I want a number here. I'll just, okay, fine. I'll just give you the number. $300 billion. $300 billion. And that's 30, 30 million felonies. You'll notice Lucius Fox mentioned spying on 300 million people. So anyway. Right, ten, so we don't encourage grand. you to build this. No. Yeah. So, okay, questions. Well, you know, the real secret is that most decisions are made by the clerks. <laughs> made <laughs> by, but... Um, Informed by the clerks. So I think that a lot more clerks are understanding these issues and trying to educate judges about these things. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, it is difficult when you're dealing with a judge or a politician who, say, has to have someone print out their email for them if they even have an email account to get them to understand how society at large relies on email for private communication. So, so I do think that younger jurists have a better grasp of these issues, but I don't want to be ageist at all. We've certainly seen good opinions from, from uh, older judges. Because it's not just the understanding, it's the understanding of the context for society as well. So they may understand the technology, but they have to understand you know, the big picture. So I think that it takes, it takes both sides of that. But yeah, we're often praying that the clerks will We'll keep the judges uh, updated on, on what the real world is like. I'll leave it to you guys. Oh. So there's precedent for using location data from cell phones to say that this person was there at the scene of the crime. Yes. Absolutely. So the question was, presuming that prosecutions often use cell phone data um, to establish your presence at a crime scene, do defendants use that same data to establish an alibi to show that they were not? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, this data is becoming more uh, widely used by both prosecutions and defense. And the same thing with video surveillance footage. You know, we actually worked on this in San Francisco, and the public defenders actually wanted a little longer data retention so that they could actually say that their clients weren't there. So. Okay, so we'll move uh, in the tour in the front. <laughs> They're supposed to. Yeah. <laughs> Fair um, use. Yes, Educational exactly. Educational criticism and critique. 
Yes. And God bless the new DMCA uh, exemption. Exactly. I, I, I take issue with your premise, although I, I'm, I'm not quite sure I understood all of it. Um, but so maybe you could, you want to come up here and say it in the mic. But I don't think AT&T can, consent, can consent to letting someone else track their customers in that manner. Okay. So what I'm saying is it's perfectly legal for me to ask 10 companies in any city if I can have a network-enabled oscilloscope. I don't know what that is. Uh, a frequency tracker. Okay. Something that just listens to radio frequencies that's not perfectly legal. is it not it's not I, i've got a radio that can i got a radio i've got an am radio that can listen to a thousand megahertz and i've got an fm radio that can listen to one point something megahertz and that's perfectly legal well my question is if i can do this i don't know that you can that's what i'm saying i mean just because something is transmitted over radio that doesn't mean that it's not protected by privacy statutes including the wiretap statute well, I mean, I can't, I can't listen to their, I can't listen to their cell phone messages because obviously CDMA and GSM are encrypted. But I can, if I have ten of them out there, I can triangulate where every cell phone is in the city. Yeah. Well, and I, I would the say that. Is where, where, why can't law enforcement do that? Well, I think again, I take issue with your premise. Uh, it would actually be illegal under the pen register statute, uh, 18 USC 3121. Uh, which regulates your acquisition by a device of uh, dialing, routing, addressing, or signaling information regarding a communication. Um, so actually that kind of monitoring without consent is in fact a federal crime, albeit a misdemeanor. Indeed. In fact, if you uh, Google for... Uh, Paul Ohm and Google Wi-Fi, and you'll see our friend Paul Ohm over the University of Colorado, formerly of DOJ, noting his belief that Google's sniffing, even if they didn't collect content, violated this pen register statute. But, all right, um, yes, sir. Well, there is a troubling Supreme Court ruling in Heibel, Heibel? Uh, uh, assessing the constitutionality of a state's stop and identify statute, mm -hmm. which gave uh, police officers the right to stop you uh, and require you to show identification. And the Supreme Court, uh, very unfortunately, uh, found that that was constitutional um, and not a search uh, or a seizure. Um, but it's been a long time since, well, a long time, a few years, uh, and I haven't paid attention to that issue in a while. But uh, certainly if robots were doing that, EFF and ACLU would be ready to, to litigate that and, issue. And, and it's an issue that we've talked about in the RFID context with surreptitious identification, you know, even if there isn't a stop. So if you're not actually stopped and seized, but they're actually identifying you surreptitiously going down the street with mass surveillance, you know, and I've written a law review article on that, talking about that um, and the Fourth Amendment implications of that. So, you know, I think that it's a little different than the dog sniff case I talked about because that person had been stopped um, for a traffic violation and, and been lawfully stopped. Um, and then there was a dog sniff. So it's a slightly, as 
lawyerly as we are, it's a slightly different avenue of jurisprudence, but it's a good question and, and something we need to continue to be vigilant about. So we've reached the end of our time here, but I did want to ask uh, people to throw out suggestions uh, on clips or movies that we might include. And yes, we are aware of the film Enemy of the State. <laughs> and, and we also, if we'd had more time here, um, we also have clips from uh, Brazil and Gattaca, so... Um, We've got those ones too, but so if just others, throw them out there. Yeah. What's that? Computer beach party. I I don't know. I'm not familiar with that, sir. Okay. Is this for your body own of lies. interest? Or? Yes. Okay. Body of lies could, oh. could be good. And we've also considered television, like 24, of course. Mm -hmm. So. The wire. The that would be a good choice. 1984, yes, but that's such a downer of a movie. Uh, Point. Brazil is a, you know, a dystopian. Penalty. Any, any others? V for Vendetta, okay. Oh. I, I have to admit and endanger my geek cred. I have not watched Torchwood, uh, but I guess I will now. Blade Runner. What surveillance do you recall from Blade Runner? Oh, the, the, okay, yeah, the uh, Voight Kampf test. THX one one three eight. Anything else? What was that? I have not seen the Echelon Code. I hear it's quite awful, but uh, but I think it's streaming for free on we could, Netflix. We could create so a new one that's B movies, yeah, <laughs> depictions we, yeah. of surveillance in B movies. Okay, well, uh, yes, sir. Real life surveillance scenarios on YouTube. Oh, good. Thank you. Oh, okay. Excellent. Eagle Eye. Okay, I haven't seen that either, but maybe I should. Huh. I shouldn't see Eagle Eye. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the warning. All right. Well, we thank you guys. We thank you guys for coming.